Welcome to another webinar from the Rolled Up Team series. Uh, today, we're actually going to chat with uh, Ryan Domain, who is Performance Director for Sport at Headington School, Oxford in the UK. Uh, Headington School, Oxford is certainly one of the more renowned uh, junior women's programs in the UK, and I thought it'd be interesting to to talk with Ryan because I know he's worked in the program for quite some time and has been responsible for much of the development, although I'm sure he'll, he'll also acknowledge that there are lots of people who've played a role in that as well. And I know it's been very much a, a team affair as Ryan has built the program up. So uh, this will be a fascinating interview for aspiring coaches and coaches who work in other programs who are just looking to to continue their own development. So first of all, uh, Ryan, welcome. Thank you, yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming on today with us. Uh, what I'd be interested to hear a little bit about before we get into the, into the Headington piece is how you found yourself in Headington because uh, there's a little bit of a South African twang there. Yeah, yeah, so um, I, I, was, I was born in South Africa. Um, my parents immigrated up there 40 odd years ago. And um, then, uh, I, you know, I kind of fell into rowing when I went to my senior school, St. Andrews College um, in Grahamstown. And um, that's pretty much where I, I found the love for the sport. Um, you know, shortly after that, I went to Rhodes University. Um, that's actually where uh, Christian Falcon, uh, the, the GB men's aids coach, she did some work with us, uh, us out there. And I, and I, you know, I think he, um, you know, he, he certainly instilled a, a lot of um, hopefully good things. Um, he might argue about that, you know, technically. Um, and then, you know, it's you know, I spent a lot of time at Rhodes, um, and and then moved up to Johannesburg to to join the squad. That ended fairly abruptly um, when my left lung collapsed. Uh, I had a spontaneous uh, pneumothorax. Um, that was five days before we were due to fly out for the Commonwealth Games, all student games, um, so it was pretty gutting. And um, and then yeah, I, 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 I was um, pulled into coaching and started coaching at a school there, St Albans College, um, uh, which is at the time was a very small um, rowing school. I think the best I'd ever done was a fifth in the C final, and um, within a year it was. A nice easy little program because we only had 30, 30 odd boys um, so you could instill change quite quickly it was myself and another another kiwi gap gap students who, who, who was coaching at, um, at the time and um and you know very soon uh, i found myself coaching uh, the national squad the junior squad and um wondering how how on earth i, I had landed up with this gig but um they said ryan just take the scanning team the scanning team don't normally do well so uh you know, just just take care of those guys and keep them out of our way while the uh, the big boys play. And um, remarkably, they they qualified. They're actually, in all fairness, a phenomenal group of young lads. And um, the uh, then suddenly I was, I was asked to take on uh, managing the eight project, which was another group, and uh, and and helping with a, a four from Grahamstown, which actually was John Gehring's uh, group. Um, I coached those guys when they were sixteen, but passed them on to, to be his 18s. And John turned up in Johannesburg. They went for qualification. The eight qualified, the four qualified, and the quad qualified. Um, and uh, ended up in, in um, Athens um, uh, at the, the test event for the, um, the, the Olympics. The Junior World Championships was there that, that year. And um, all manner of curveballs were thrown at us with the shortening of the course. Um, which uh, made that very interesting. Um, but all in all, my quad was second in the B final. But I remember at the time, you know, seeing uh, some big bald guy strutting around and another very serious bald guy strutting around. And uh, one of them was um, was Peter Peter Shepherd, and um, the other one was John Lang. And I, you know, that that GB team looked incredibly professional. And I thought, you know what, I'm I'm completely out of my depth. So. Um, decided that at the end of that year I'd, I'd go over to the UK and you know it'd be nice and easy I should be able to jump in and, and coach and do some good stuff but it took a while um, to do that and I ended up working um, getting a job in the April of 2004 um, with Headington School um, uh, working with a guy called Andy Green I was really lucky actually to, to be working under him 
Yeah, Andy and I both uh, went to Imperial, so Andy was sort of, yeah. we overlapped uh, at Imperial, so I know Andy quite well, and I remember him starting uh, his coaching at Headington. Uh, it was quite an exciting time. Yeah, well, he was he was a, 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 I wouldn't say this to his face, because, you know, I don't want his ego to get too big, but actually, in all fairness, he was a brilliant men mentor and um, kept my overzealous, overeager um running before learning how to walk um younger coach himself uh, at bay um so you know i, I really do you know i gotta acknowledge that he, he was he was instrumental in, in in helping you know me get to where i where i am today so what year again was that that you you came over that was uh, i arrived in the december of 2003 and then um, okay i i started at headington in the april of 2004 Okay, so it's been a it's been a good long spell. You have seen a yeah. program actually evolve, and the program didn't was only set up. Was Andy one of the first coaches there, or was the program <laughs> running prior to that? The, 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 it had been running prior to that. The, you know, it, it had been established for about I think since nineteen ninety two. Um, but Andy was brought in really to kind of give that the program its next level and the next step and. They certainly did that, you know, winning championship girls eight that year. Um, I think, you know, they were against a very stacked crew uh, from LH, and I think there were four rowers who had rowed in the Junior Worlds eight the year before from LH. So, you know, Andy did a great job in turning that round. Um, the difficulty, certainly when I arrived, was um, was having that kind of that, that constant pipeline of good athletes coming through. So, you know, with Andy, that became a, a key objective is, is work on you know the enjoyment of rowing within within the boat club and try to get the numbers going through because at the time we only had a, about 60 odd athletes i think our first rowing camp that we took was 20 athletes and now you know when we look at taking rowing camp we're, we're taking 80 odd girls to rowing camp um you know the boat club's 150 um you know when it's when it's doing pretty well and i think runs at an average of 140 odd. so okay so that's that's a over the course of let's say 20 years that's the magnitude of the type of change that you've seen across the club through a lot of hard work. Yeah. And I was, obviously we've spent a little bit of time prior to this talking about how we'd run this session. And one of the documents, and I think it's a really good way to, to set the scene on the program is that parents presentation that you actually use yeah. to, yeah. to introduce parents and it'll serve as a good way to introduce our viewers to, to the club. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll get that started now. Um, and I'll, there it um let me just pop that up and present so um uh, you know the one thing about Hennington is it, it's it's a it's a highly academic school um you know it's it's an all girls school uh, we have a prep school um and there's about a you know 750 in a senior school the prep school is about 200 odd um but you know we have to get this balance right within the boat club you know we can't we cannot um you know Thrash our athletes. We can't do more than our prescribed training sessions that we do. Um, and but we, we really do work well as a team. So if I just go over, essentially, you know, um, what it's about. Um, and I think it really does come down to um, you know what this kind of this principle of being an athlete scholar. Um, you know, our rowers here are. You know, if you look at that, that that's our, our alumni eight from last year that race. It. Katie Greaves is the only person who, in that eight, um, went to the Olympics. Um, she went to three Olympic Games. Um, but, uh, and she's sitting in the bow seat there. Quite likes the bow seat, because if I recall from uh, Tomo's presentation, she was there in the bow seat. And, um, but, you know, the academic side comes first. We've got a number of girls here who are at Yale, UCLA, Virginia. Um, we've got a girl in the seven seat who's at Brooks. Um, another girl in the four seat who is, is, is in Amsterdam studying there. So, you know, and a girl in the three seat who's at Cambridge. Um, uh, you know, the Cox, the, the, the Cox is at Imperial, you'll be glad to hear. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and really, you know, the whole thing is, is, is about, you know, we always say that, you know, 100% of the time you get 100% of your effort um, that you put in. And, you know, if you sixty percent, if you're only putting sixty percent effort in, you're only getting sixty percent back, hundred percent of the time. So, you know, it's really important to to have a, a good ethos across the academic and the sports side of things. Um, and you know, and this goes from all sides of of of, of 
the school, you know, we've, we've got a phenomenal parent group. You know, I've really got to, to say they are the backbone of the organization. You know, you know, if I'm being really honest, it, 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 you know, we would not be where we, we are today if it weren't for the support of our parents. Um, and, you know, also our, 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 our you know, the school staff, you know, we do work as a team and it's not just, you know, us coaches in isolation. Okay, so what type of role, Ryan, do the parents actually play in the club? So, so we have a parents committee and they help support the communication, um, both from the coaches to the, 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 the parent group and back to us coaches. And, you know, we always say it's, it's not a selection forum, um, but if they do have any questions, they are welcome to ask that. But, you know, they run things like our, our, um, our, our, our own supper. We normally have a, an Olympian or, or a high performance athlete of some sort talking every year. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a fundraiser. We're currently in the process of, 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 of raising money for a boat club, which, which uh, our own boat house, which um, we will hopefully get underway once, um, once everything calms down with COVID-19. Um, but in addition, it's, you know, it's just supporting at regattas. Um, you know, they're, they're the ones who transport backwards and forwards. Um, yeah, you know, and, and that communication, I think that's probably the, the, the best avenue of support is being able to say, look, you know, um, we op- I keep my door open um, for, you know, the, uh, the last 10, 15 minutes of, of training every, you know, every session. And if they want to book into a slot, they can come, they can come, come in and, and chat about their daughters or about something they want to support the boat club with or an idea that, that they have. Uh, um, and I think it really does come down to, you know, yes, Chris Hermes is head of rowing. Uh, I head up the coaching side of things. Um, uh, the parents uh, give us valuable feedback about the experience that their daughters are having. Um, and, you know, including the experience academically from, from the school side of things. And that whole network works really well. It is a, a holistic, um, you know, uh, uh, approach to to how we run the boat club you know I, I i don't know everything and i really do rely on my parents and their skill set to come in and say actually ryan you can be doing this this way in terms of fundraising or have you looked at this in terms of um you know even the land where you know we found for our boat house you know parents were saying why don't you try here this looks like it's it's, it's up you know that's really important so is it set up as an official committee then from year to year yeah. with with various roles yeah Okay. Traditionally, it's the captain's uh, and vice captain's parents, and then a, a parent rep or two parent reps from each year group, um, and then we have a treasurer on top of that, and who helps out with that with, with supporting the boat club. But if there's one bit of advice I'd say to all coaches is get that working well because it is worth you know ten times what you know your your, your input. You know, it really does help. Um, you know, it's almost like a crescendo of, of, of you know, a momentum that builds from a parent group that helps support the, the boat club and uh, the school. So you see it as a multiplier for sure. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Ultimately, we're working for an athlete scholar. You know, um, um, this 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 works. You know, and this is something that we we say to the parents because um, it's you know we always say how responsible you are, and um, you know, and, and for us. It's important that, you know, and I, spoke, you know, I spoke to you before about this, but it's important that we as coaches have our, you know, our roles and, you know, but in, in, more importantly, we have our own kind of, you know, a value system and, and, and ethos and culture within the group. Now, before I even go into this, this works for Headington. You know, it would have to be completely reformed if I was, say, going to Abingdon or to Eton or to... LEH, you know, they, 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 they operate differently and they, there are slightly different cultural things that operate there. But, you know, we always say to them, you know, um, and this, 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 we, we were talking about academics here as well as, um, as um, the, you know, the, being a rower. Um, but, you know, everyone's talented to a degree, um, but unless you're, you know, you, 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 you have that engagement, you're nowhere, um, you know. You, you can attend lessons, but unless you're really focused and engaged and attentive and you put in the effort, then you're not going to get anywhere. Um, that's probably the next thing is, you know, unless you have goals and a plan, you may as well be dreaming. Um, so, you know, we do ask them to set high expectations for themselves, both in the classroom 
and for their sports. Um, you know, remember we are a school, so they 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 do hockey, they do netball, they do athletics. Um, you know, we're we're not just like a club where they turn up and what's well, only about running. You know, we have to work within the whole system of the school. And for me as performance director, it's really important. You know, one of my key girls in, in, in my senior squad this year uh, also was part of the national um, under-16 hockey team. Um, you know, she was instrumental in both areas, um, and I think that's quite important. But, you know, again, she had very clear goals and a very clear plan, and we provide that plan as, as an attachment to our training program so they can write that in. Okay, so do the girls actually participate in more than one sport then, typically? Yeah, yeah. When it gets to the sick form, typically they'll narrow it down. Um, but we do support them doing doing other sports. But again, you know, you do, you know, there there are um, expectations. So you know, we do have a, a a hard line, and then we have guidelines, and then we have certain things that have no lines, so to speak. So yeah. with that hockey player, I worked with the hockey coach who is outstanding, a guy called Alex Williams, and um, you know, he he. Um, uh, I know if she's going to his, his hockey training session, I know she's going to get the training needed for that day. And it really is a, a communication. Uh, you know, we, 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 we're in the same department, so we, we, we speak regularly. Um, I think that's quite important. Okay, fantastic. Um, this, is a, this is a quote that we always give, give to the girls, but essentially, you know, um, that was a quote from um, uh, one of our former rows, Fee Gammon, who's now in the women's aids, and she's going, Tokyo, and um, well, was in the women's eight. I don't know what boat she's in now. Um, that's a question mark. So uh, <laughs> I did ask her the other day, and she's like, I "Can't say." Um, so uh, yeah, she has been in the women's eight and um, the GB squad, and um, but that's success that side, and that's the same thing with academics. Um, that's the same thing with rowing, and then the, the other thing is the teachable side of things. You know, are they available, engaged, and on time? Um, and the last thing is comes back to that athlete's follower is, um, you know, we will teach them the what and the how. They need to know the why. Um, and, and that's hopefully underpins everything that we're doing. Um, but it gives, it gives a good sense of what the boat club's about. Um, you, you, when you look down this boat here, she went to Yale. She's at Exeter. was another 23 lightweight medals. She went to Durham, um, um, Exeter. Uh, I think also um, uh, she was a, a Exeter captain, Yale captain. Uh, Edinburgh captain. Um, she's now studying dentistry at Bristol after having gone to Newcastle. So you know that that academic side is the most important important thing. This is just a fun thing they do on the side. Yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm sure some of the the habits and disciplines that they're picking up just getting organised spreads across the whole spectrum, really, academic and sport. Yeah, yeah, completely. Um. So if I just go through this quickly, this, this is what we showed to the parents is, you know, that academic side is really important. Um, and, you know, the, 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 their ability to be, um, you know, uh, represent GB um, at some level or another, whether it's junior or, you know, J16 to, um, you know, hopefully the, the senior squad at some point. Um, you know, I mean, you know, Lydia here, she was in the, the four that, that won gold at the end of 23. Never went to the junior world. She went to the coop. Did phenomenally there. Um, you know, and you know, it's nice to see people like Lydia doing really well. Um, but you know, we'll see what happens over the next few years. I'm not saying these guys are going to go represent be in the Olympics or whatever, but it's nice that they are successful. Whatever they set their heart into. This is um, uh, uh, something I usually show the parents about grades within the school, and it's always interesting that when people say, you know. I told you about it. We've got a, a, a spreadsheet um, uh, that has uh, certainly every rower from uh, well, the last 16 years and everything about their ergo performances, the three key 2K ones, the three key 5K ones, um, you know, their half hours and, you know, whatever other performance, you know, water performances and uh, also their grades. And so we can track this. And this is, this is really nice to see is that it will always be your high performers, you know, in terms of the general school population. Um, but when people say, well, I'm, I'm quitting rowing because I want to focus on my academics, it doesn't always work out. Um, so we always give a tentative warning. We, you know, if I did feel, and there have been cases where I've thought, actually, there are some girls who would be better focusing on academics because they are struggling. 
Um, but those are rare. I mean, I've had two where I've actually had that in my entire time at Headington. Um, but on the whole, this is the picture you'll see from the rain group. So quite a nice one too. Yeah, that's a very strong, very strong message. And like you say, if it's based, okay, that you're showing five years of data for that. How many data points would be in that typically for five years? Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's hard. It, I mean, when, when, I, when I, I'm looking at, at all the GCSE subjects, so that would be, um, what's our GC, GCSE group now? We've got about 10 odd girls in our GCSE group right now. So that's 50 odd girls um, across you know, uh, all the subjects that they're, they're doing. So another, another 10 odd subjects that they're doing. Um, yeah. So that's, that's 500 data points there, you know. Um, so that's quite nice to, to actually have a look at it from that perspective. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone's ever gonna going to take you on and go, oh, well, this rowing program, uh, it kills everything else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and if, if, it, if, it, if it did, I'm sure my boss would um, call me into the office and say, Ryan, we need to have words. So, um, yeah, yeah it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Um, academics would trump everything, and I'm sure um, that's what's, what's really important. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, you know, this is just a bit about the new boat house. You can see land that we bought and some stuff, which is you know, quite exciting for us, but uh, we still... So what, what stage is that at currently? Uh, still raising money. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, we, we have, we've got two million to raise. Um, and you currently row out of that earlier, the boathouse that's shown on yeah, that earlier yes. slide. So Edwards are really good to us. And we've, we've been with them for years now. So we've got that kind of middle boat bay on the right-hand side of the boat, boat uh, bay, um, just the right-hand side. We've got, I think, that rack, that rack, and that rack there. And then um, part of the lean-to over here. Um, and these are the launches that we, we, uh, we, we roll in. Um, as Matthew Pinsett just described it as a... a cardboard box on, on some sort of container. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay, so that gives us a little bit of a background on, on the school and, and how the rowing program fits into that, which I think is, is really nice to actually, well, incredibly powerful to see that you can demonstrate how rowing and, and have other sports done this similarly in the school as well, logged just that data? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think because I've been here for so long, um, I've just, I mean, I, I, I think I told you with all that data that I have, I think it's 62,000 data points on that spreadsheet. Um, and it's just useful for when we reflect on what our program's doing um, and, and how our training program's adapting and evolving. Um, you know, we, we've got to be able to quantify things to some degree. Um, so um, in other sports, to answer your question, I mean, Alex is fantastic with that, um, you know, and his management of the squad. But again, he's fairly new to school. Same with Natasha Vickers. She's um, a new, fairly new to the school. She runs our netball program. Um, you know, Danny Travis on our football program, he's doing an outstanding job. But again, he's fairly new. Um, to, mm. um, so... Yeah, I think in time, those things will develop within, within the school culture and um, the coaching context. You know, you've just got a new director of sports, um, Sarah Huggins, and she's fantastic. Um, so we're pulling those things together as a team. Yeah. I mean, what I love about this is, you know, <laughs> the engineer in me is, is data, data, data. <laughs> when you have data, it just allows you to inform what you're doing and to reflect on what you're doing. And not just like we've spoken about this and I, I know we share an interest in uh, the impact of bias uh, yeah. on decision making and the, and the ability to, to think critically. Um, so that does lead us on to with regard to your training program and how that has evolved over the years, how you've used the data to inform what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if I just add in here quickly, um, Chris Hermes is our head of rowing now. In fact, I employed him years ago as, as a boatman. And uh, when I became director of sports, he stepped in to help me run the club. And actually, he evolved into being um, head of rowing. And um, uh, so he now has taken my data sheets from then and just put them on steroids. Um, so, uh, you know, it's really useful to have someone who, who can, can do that and who I can also bounce ideas off. And, 
you know, he started with the J14s um, and now has worked with me side by side with the first eight for a number of years. And we work as a team and I think that's really important. Um, you know, so coming onto the program, um, if I just, I just share that with you again. Um, so I'm gonna share with you the, the summary because I will hopefully explain a few things on how we do things. Um, can I just maximize that? Yeah, can see it there. Can you see the whole thing? Just yep. Go there and uh, let me just zoom in a bit so people can see. Um, so um, this is, I think this is tw uh, 2018. Um, I pulled this from because it was a fairly clear year. Um, so even though we didn't win national schools that year, it kind of gives you an indication of, of what we do. Um, so we break everything up into really easy, manageable and understandable zones. Just, you know, we call it an RPE zone, just one to, uh, one to four, you know, a traffic light system. And if you know of any of Stephen, uh, Stephen Silas, stuff, um, he talks a lot about having traffic lights. Um, so, you know, and although he, he has a philosophy where, you know, it is completely polarized. For, for us, sometimes it's impossible to, to do that. Um, and we, we, we do go into to kind of zone three, if, uh, as you'll see from the pro program. And, and actually, I feel we need to. Uh, you, you might need to zoom in a little bit more on that, Ryan. It's, it's showing quite a lot of a blank sheet on the right-hand side. Let me just go right in. Can you see that now? Uh, yeah. Is that better? Uh, that's better for me. Hopefully, for our viewers, it's uh, working. Cool. Let's just do that. Cool. Um, so, oh, just up to there. so essentially, um, that's that's the kind of zoning I use. I mean, you know, there's there's loads of different ways of explaining it, but I think for, for my athletes, they really understand what this means. And you know, when you have your your um, your zone, your minutes, and your distance. Um, yeah, the athletes understand it. It's really simple. It's really clear. Um, I've also put down, you know, some lactates. We do um, the lactate testing um, at Headington, and you know, that's more to to try keep people within a certain band, um, rather than to allowing them to kind of drift into three or you know, you, you put a young athlete on a, on an ergo and they're going to try thrashers. You know, they're, they're naturally get competitive. So this tries to hold them back. So tell us about putting in the lactate testing because this is always an interesting conversation as soon as you mention in certain environments yeah. you mentioned taking blood yeah yeah so now i i, I you know i i trained as a as a uh, you know at university one of my first first um degrees involved physiology and and then uh, i was speaking to charlie simpson who is um uh, now i need to get his title right but he is in charge of the msc exercise or he was in charge of the msc exercise and physiology um, at Oxford Brooks, and Oxford Brooks, as you know, is just over the road from us. So, when I was drawing a program, and you know, even even before we went into lockdown, I'd show him the, the, the program, and he he will ask questions, and I think that's really healthy. Um, and so, he suggested a few years ago, going, look, you know, how do you know are they actually in zone two? You know, so we use heart rate monitors, and we yes, all my rowers have GPS heart rate monitors so we can we can track what they're doing um, but then we started looking at the heart rates and going well actually is that ut2 for them so um, i went into the headmistress's office and said look we've got a lot of girls who are ill um, and we you know I don't, know I don't think this is normal and we're getting a few injuries i'm not really that comfortable with it uh, and i presented why i think we should be doing the lactates um, now, being in the Oxford area, we've got Oxford professors, we've got doctors at John Radcliffe, we've got, um, you know, very intelligent parents who, by their own right, are also athletes and also competing at a very high level. Um, you know, some of our athletes are triathletes and so forth. Some of our parents are triathletes and so forth. And they'll, they would question things like this. So um, the headmistress was very happy for us to to run blood lactates as long as there's a parental consent form and some we followed and adhered to the strip up into daily. Um, and we've been running that for a number of years now. And you know, I give these as examples, but I've got athletes who are need to train on 1.4 millimoles because otherwise they, they you know issues i've got other uh, athletes who are you know on on 2.3 millimoles 
and they are perfectly fine uh, sitting there at the maximum steady state. So every single athlete will have a band or what that they need to sit on. Um, and then this is when I say every single athlete from my senior squad within my senior squad. So that's the 12 odd girls that are in my, my, my top squad. Um, beyond that, we, we don't test. Um, so this is the top 12 girls, but then how many others sit underneath that? Oh, there's about another, um, you know, then you're looking at, you're going to the J16s, but uh, you, you, you're probably looking at um, uh, in J16 and 15 group, another 25 odd girls um, in that group. Um, but we, you know, we, don't, we don't test them, there's no need to. They just need to learn how to train on perceived exertion. You know, that's the best thing for them. And, they can learn how to train on, on perceived exertion. They're doing well. Um, and I'm lucky I've got like Katie Greaves who, who's running my J16 group. And, you know, she's very, very competent. And, and another, another, another young lady called Naki Holt and, who um, runs the SNC and um, uh, helps out with the, um, you know, their strength and conditioning on that group. Yeah. And have you been able to satisfy yourself as to the impact of this change in that, for that top group? Yeah. I mean, you know, like... Um, I mean, when I used to speak to Paul Thompson, he used to say, well, you know, the energy requirement of, you know, of a 2000 meter race is, you know, 80% aerobic and then the rest is anaerobic. So our training needs to reflect that. And, you know, you, you speaking to Charlie Simpson, you know, he'll look at, at my program and go, okay, you know, he'll probably pick up here and go, why are you coming off so much UT2, you know, down in uh, May and, and, and June. But actually, the, the, you, know, our, you know, if you look at our, minutes they do drop down quite significantly because we come into that exam period um you know average me uh you know weekly minutes do have to drop and um we even shorten the sessions come, come the summer um you know we don't run until 6 30 we run until 6 p.m um and it's just to get them home so they can get studying again um so yeah you know it's we, we have to try balance out what we're trying to get out um of the session and i think there's a couple of videos that you you have which you can go over later but you'll see us kind of teetering pretty much in this area here you know um because we're doing 24 26 28 work to try um develop rhythm and, uh, and efficiency so you know to answer your question how's my, my the, the evolution of the training program worked i've always been a big fan of good ut2 work um that's just my preference um, and you know, we do a lot of that in, in, in small boats. Um, it works for us because our river is so, so, uh, so short. We've got 1,800 meters of decent river, and then it gets really narrow, and then we've got another K after that. And you just hope there isn't someone coming in the opposite direction. So um, uh, that does help. But also, if you look at the program, you'll see, you know, like if I just go like for like, September here, yeah, our 15s and 16s are doing fewer minutes pretty much all the way through. Um, so we do try to build the group into the senior senior program. But even that, you know, people would be quite surprised as to how much we actually do of that contact time, you know, pushing for landing stage. Okay. What age do the girls start in the program at? Um, we have a novice group, which starts at 12. But to be honest, it's just fundamentals and, you know, emphasis on the fun part. Um, mm. And, you know, they, 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 they train in September, once it gets to half term, we stop them rowing over the winter months. We start them again in the summer. Um, and the idea there is that they just get a taste of it and a flavor of it. But we really encourage them to go do as many different sports as they can, all, all the way up until 14. And in 14, they, um, they, they start working on a, a, you know, they might be doing hockey and rowing, or they might be doing um, and, and football, so they might do three of the, the big sports. Obviously, everyone does uh, athletics in the summer, but it's um, it's imp it's important that they they have a broad base of sports. I don't want just rowers; I want good athletes. Yeah, so you're quite happy for them to be multi-sport athletes, and when they enjoy rowing, they'll make the choices they want to make as they go forward. Yeah, yeah, completely. completely. Okay. Fantastic. So, and maybe, maybe it's not that easy to show, to show that, but the data there that you have shown presumably has, has just compiled out of, are you tagging your training program each week then when you're designing yeah. your program? 
So I, um, I mean, I know there are these, all these fancy programs out there and you know, my advice to any budding young coach is just learn Excel and learn Google, you know, uh, uh, you know the Google platform, or whatever you want to do, but just you need to know Excel. Um, well, one, I don't like sharing my data with anyone, um, you know, in terms of outside my organization. I don't think it's, I don't think it's safe. Um, and two, I think when you start, you know, I'm quite, you know, in terms of critical think, uh, thinking is when you've got another program um, that you're relying on, that kind of, you know, separating fact from fiction and being able to, to, to collate your questions in such a way that, that it asks the right questions, not just the answers that you want to have. And that, that, that sense of crises that might creep in. And my, my big thing is, is having a spreadsheet that's a bit more open and you can use formulas to ask certain questions. And then you can come from another side, which is where Chris is great. Um, you know, uh, he's, Chris Hermes is a, is, a, is a mathematician. Um, so he'll come from the other side and go, but actually, if we look at it this way, this is what we're getting. So it um, doesn't make it easier, but it actually makes our exploration of what's going on really interesting. And we can start forming our questions that help us um, look at a training program and go, okay, this is how we're getting it. So to answer your question about how do we tag those things, um, uh, at the end of each week, I, 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 I retrospectively go back and, and well, at the end of each day, I go back and I just change the numbers of what I've seen. And when the girls upload load their data, their heart rate data, I can say actually, you know, on average it was this. Gosh, I got popped into the training program, um, or that didn't have that effect. I did, ex you know, expect it to be UT two, but actually, we, we probably spent a bit more time kind of in zone uh, in zone three, um, and you know, we need to come back and reevaluate what's the remainder of the week, so we we come back down on our values. Okay. And what are they uploading into Training Peaks or something like that? What yeah. are you using to consolidate it? Uh, we use Training Peaks, but uh, also we just use RPE a lot. So when they're on the Ergo, we, we have a Google spreadsheet that we just fill up all their names on the order of Ergo. And as they leave the room, they just say, this is my split, this is my RPE, and this is um, you know, my heart rate. And it's just really quick, type it in, and we can pull up, you know, because it's all filtered, we can, we can grab athletes' data. And, and it also feeds through to their own personal um, sheets. So it grabs all their data that we've typed in and goes onto their own personal um, uh, athlete profile. And um, so they can view that, they can show their parents if they want. So it's pretty, pretty conclusive. It has everything, oh. you name it, it has it. So. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And okay, I may be putting you on the spot a little bit here and if, if anything doesn't come to mind instantly, not a problem, but can you think of any, pivotal moment with an individual athlete where you've you've been able to dig back through the data and if you like solve a problem or mm, yeah. identify an issue yeah i had one athlete who's really strong um and she um uh, just just had the right head on her shoulders great leader um she ended up rowing in my quad at henry royal in 2018 and um but she just you know, she'd get, she just had flatlined on the, um, um, on, on her 2K performance. And we had a look at her numbers and, um, you know, although she looked strong on the ergo and although everything looked all right, um, we just did a lot more digging into how we did our blood lactates. And we found that actually the way we were doing our blood lactates, she was falling through, through the net. So we actually changed our protocol to involve now, I think we've got now three things that we look at for our protocol on our blood lactates. One is an endurance piece, and then the other one is a stage st step test and how we do that stage step test. And then, you know, the last thing was basically a water-based um, test and looking, looking and seeing how her heart rate monitor linked to that. And we actually just said, okay, you need to go on what because she was so variable on the heart rates. And very quickly, much to her frustration, and, and, um, and she was quite a fiery girl as it was, um, she, you know, we, we dropped her literally onto 120 watts. And she's like, but I've been sitting at like, you know, 150, 160. Like, this is this is ridiculous. And she's, and actually, she rode a few months on that, and suddenly her ergos just absolutely climbed. Um, you know, so much so she she was in in that that eight that uh, I think is on one of the videos that um, broke the record at Henley Women's. Um, you know, she she was a, a very very talented young woman. Um, but that, that, that I'd say was key. Okay. So, and this is just a question 
almost a, at this stage, a fundamental belief question as a, as a coach, how strongly you subscribe to a polarized program? Yeah, I mean, I do. I, 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 it's, I, th I think certainly within the context of Headington, it's, it is a full day. They start at 8.25 with the registration and they finish at 4 p.m. And it is literally bosh, 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 lesson after lesson after lesson. And the expectations in the mind is high. And then on top of that, you know, there, there are a few hours of prep each night. Um, and then you've got to fit in running. Now, you know, um, I'd say that Friday is sometimes our day off. Um, and, you know, I look at the training program, the girls are walking and going, we're not doing what's in the program today. We're going much lighter because you guys look a mess. Um, and you've got, to, you've got to be able to, and I always say this to the girls, is you need to self-regulate. You know, if you come into the gym and you say to me, Brian, I can't, I can't do this today. It's like, fine, we'll just change your program. You T2 bike rather than actually the hard work. Um, and I think that's really important, that discussion with the athletes, the fact that, you know, they can come in and have that discussion with myself, Chris, Katie, Natalie. You know, one of my coaches, you know, at the end of the day, it, we're here to help the athletes, not you know, they're not there to serve us. And I don't care about medals or whatever. I care about whether or not they are enjoying rowing as much as I did as a junior. Excellent. Yeah. How the rise program's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, I'm, I'm totally with you on that one. It's very easy to end up, end up in the muddy ground in the middle uh, with, with a program and end up at threshold in both directions. Yeah, um, yeah, completely. Know, uh, and it takes quite a lot of... I guess, fortitude as a coach to really persist and to be able to demonstrate that. And, and I've no doubt that with, with the data that you have, and I mean, there's enough data out there in terms of research as well. It's the way we should go. It's just trying to make sure that we, f we fit it in. I think there's mm -hmm. often a, a sense of pressure that if I only have a certain amount of time, I need to jack the training up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, and that's, that's sometimes the, I mean, the, the GD program is great in terms of what it, delivers and what it offers for juniors in this country. Um, uh, but, you know, could we apply that to Haddington? We couldn't because they, they, my guys would just burn out. I wouldn't have athletes at the end of the year. In the same respect, I've got to rely on the athletes that I send to trials being the ones who can just through talent, you know, that, that, that can, and through our program can make it rather than trying to shortcut and trying to do a bit of speed work and a bit of this and a bit of that to try to get them to that first you know, November ergo, and then the February ergo, and then, you know, I can't rely on those little pinch points. I just have to follow my program. And at the end, hopefully I'll have athletes that can, you know, ship and aid, um, can look at it and go, okay, cool. These guys merit being within this program. Okay. So the, the athletes that are aspiring to selection still mm -hmm. pretty much follow the school program. They're not doing they anything. To. Yeah. No, no. Uh, um, they need to follow the school program. Um, you know, if they've got aspirations, and I had a number of girls this year who were, you know, doing fantastically. Um, and, you know, there, there are, they all made it by merits on the program that we did, you know, to that point. But that also means that by the end of the season, we're, we're, in, we're in a good situation for them to be selected if they make the, the rest of the cutoffs. Um, but I can't shortchange, uh, you know, the long-term athlete development for just a short-term game. Mm -hmm. And just an opportune moment here, Ryan, to just discuss a little bit about how it all went down, in effect, closing down a program in this type of situation or having to yeah. not necessarily close it down, having to transition the type of challenges that you faced and how you address those. Yeah, I mean, we, we um, I must say, like, because we're so open with our communication and, you know, Chris is really good at the moment we're about to announce something for girls he'll have that email written up and, you know, between him and I will drop an email and say, okay, cool. This is what needs to go. And while I'm speaking to the athletes, he'll hit send to the parents. Um, so that communication is, you know, parents get it, kids get it, they come together in the car, they can chat about it. But I think, you know, culturally, particularly this year, I had an amazing uh, captain, Amana, and um, you know, this year who really worked on, on that communication with coaches and the group and particularly the younger year groups, all the way down to J13. And, um, you know, she was instrumental behind that. I keep saying she, she needs to be setting her sights high in terms of like managing some big corporation. Um, but she, you know, with her, the captains, the coaches, we, we were communicating really early about our best case scenario as well. We, you know, we, we missed a few races and then we're back, off, you know, after rain camp or whatever. Worst case scenario, this. And we kind of went on a philosophy of um, 
kind of the the uh, the hunter troop, the Norwegian Women Special Forces group, and just saying, well, look, you know, they don't know when we've been called into war, so we need to have that same approach. Um, we don't know when we're going to be called up, when, you know, there might be something right at the end, end of the season, or actually, worst, worst, worst case scenario is you, you're ready for university. Um, so we almost had a seamless transition into this, this lockdown. Um, and there weren't any tears, there weren't any of those issues. I think the upset came about not being able to raise national schools, those girls um, who had worked so hard, not being able to raise Henry Women's, Henry Royal, um, not going on their own camp, which is a really team collective thing. Um, so I think, but all in all, you know, I was really proud about how the athletes handled that. I think, you know, all credit to them because they put really good heads on their shoulders. And I think it's part of what the culture of the club is. Um, because we had talked about it so much about what might happen and got our captain to actually deliver that message to the girls. Um, you know, this is plan one, uh, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, worst case scenario, stage four, but this is where we're falling back to, you know, our so-called retreat lines. Um, and, but actually they, um, you know, they, I think they handled it very well. We packed up everything and sent it home with them. Um, the, uh, kind of took, took the approach that, um, you know, better to, to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. So I sent all the Ergos bikes and gym equipment home with the, the, the girls. And, and, uh, and actually, the, um, my line manager, um, Simon Hawks, uh, came up and said, great idea. That's fantastic that you're sending that stuff home with, with, with the Rose. And the bursa, who I was going to ask permission from, he was like, Ryan, brilliant. That's fantastic. But that's, I think, again, you know, I, I joke about the permission side, but I, I know I have the support of the school, um, and I know they trust what we're doing. So that really does help um, moving forward. Yeah, sounds like a, it's a very supportive environment. Uh, yeah, if, if the bursar is just backing you up straight away, as opposed to doing an inventory <laughs> count, you know, you know, you're on the right track. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's great. He's very good. He's Fantastic. Very good. What what I'm going to do is just run some video in the background, and we'll move the conversation on to talk a little bit about about how you want to roll. Okay. And, and some of the basic ideas and maybe how, how your yeah. thoughts may have evolved or changed uh, over the years. So it's just a bit of video that, uh, that you shared with me. Uh, and is, is that it running there now? Can you see yeah. that? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a blotch on the screen for some reason. Oh, hang on. I will uh, get rid of those. There we go. There cool. we um, so that's, that's where we were. That's Godstow. Um, uh, uh, it's within the Oxford Ring Road, but it's, um, it's very quiet, big, big meadow over there. Um, so this is um, uh, my 2017 crew. And uh, I think the, 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 the issue we had is the weekend before they had, had a, a proper walloping. They, 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 they got um, uh, Henley really turned them over. And um, um, so on a few things in terms of how we want to row. Firstly, I'm a big fan of learning how to scull. Um, I just don't think that um, anyone, you know, should be in a sweet boat if they don't know how, how to scull. Um, you know, it is a fundamental of, of, of what we do, especially on our stretch being 1.8k. Um, so you can probably see from this video, but it was uh, it was what we saw when they were racing. It was really aggressive, 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 and you know, our um, the core fundamentals of what we work on are rhythm, relaxation, and efficiency, and really that conservation of momentum. Um, so when I talk about that kind of rhythm, it's 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 that it's all set up by by how we organise off the back end, um, how we organise into the front, um, that stability and almost stillness into the front, and and then being able to to load the spoon effectively so we can can focus on getting getting the load through the heels and into the glutes. Um, and then it's maintaining that, that back end length. And you can see you know, people just chipping away at the back end. Um, so these were 500 meter pieces um, against the second eight, or may have been the 16 eight there in the distance on the left. Um, but it's, uh, you know, fundamentally, we, we, we're, we're trying to um, establish an efficiency. I mean, you know, that year they, they, they were out erred by a long way. And, you know, we often get the GP bergs and there was, I don't know, you know, my career would definitely completely out urged. So you have to work on, on, on those fundamentals to make a boat move um, effectively and efficiently. Uh, efficiently. And um, see in a moment, we, I pull up and I, I, I think I talk um, 
on, on the fact that actually they, they need to just relax a bit more and give the boats a bit of time so they can finish each stroke. Um, and, okay. and you've mentioned sculling there at the outset. So just yeah. give us a sense of how that, how that plays itself out as they go through, you know, from when they start rowing, how much do they learn to scull first? And right. how everyone, it up, everyone up to, up until J15 um, is sculling. Um, they they are either in in quads, doubles, but single scull for my seniors is the cornerstone of what we do. I think we probably spend easily. I think I, I worked it out um, for this year, and it was something in the region of sixty percent of the year in singles. Um, you know, it is a large proportion of the minutes that we do are in single skulls. Um, and one, you know, gives me a really good opportunity to be able to coach them, that, you know, those finer de details, you know, we've got stroke coaches and people have telemetry and all these kind of things, but actually what you've got to learn is feel, you know, and boat feel for me is, is, uh, you know, is, 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 is a religion in the boat. It really has to be the thing that you, you work on the most. Um, but also for, for young women, um, it minimizes injury. You know, I can, I can set up a, you know, a bunch of singles for them and you know, make sure they're rowing within their range and you know, get it right for them and, 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 and know that they are getting good training UT2-wise. Um, uh, that's the cardboard box that we, we, we drive around in. Um, so you know, it's, it's quite a nice um, way to kind of start them off. And they can circulate. There's enough coaches on the water at any given one time to, um, you know, should, should there, there be an issue, someone falls in, um, they'll be picked up within, you know, a minute or so. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, I can stop and I can work on an athlete for, for a bit. Chris can stop, he can work on an athlete. And we circulate through all the athletes together, Chris and I. Um, okay. On. So typically on, on that type of day when you have the girls out sculling, are, are pretty much all of them out sculling or are some out sculling and some out sweeping? Yeah, we don't have skulls for everyone in the boat club. Um, you know, it, really the, the skulls are, are the priority of the senior group in the first part of the season, um, right the way through to kind of February. Um, and then we start integrating some of the 15s and 16s um, that overlap a bit more right the way through rain camp and into to the summer. And then the J4 teams take over. Um, so the proportion of sculling they get, they all need to know how to scull. Um, you know, uh, we do have some older skulls that our J15s will spend September and October in. Um, but uh, essentially, that's, that's a priority. That's small boat work, that's sculling work. And you know, even, even until March, we spent, I think before Quinton, we did two sessions in the eight this year. Um, the eight's not a priority for us early season. Uh, sculling, rowing a quad, rowing doubles, um, that's the priority. Because also you, you, you're getting this uniformity in terms of how, how they row, you, you know, the lats are developing the same way on either side of the body. And I think particularly for women, young women, that upper body strength is really important in a single. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and that, that long-term development in terms of, you know, the, 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 you, we just minimize injury and I, I get more people rowing for longer um, because of that. Um, and also, it also means I can swap them, you know, like Danielle in front of us, she could row stroke side and bar side. The girl behind her, she could row stroke side and bar side. You know, I need eight people going for eight seats rather than, you know, someone going for four seats because they're only a stroke sider. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice assistant coach there as well. Uh, yeah. He's, he, he's, he's my right hand man. That's <laughs> goes everywhere with me. Excellent. So how many sculling boats then? are in your fleet, as an example, just to give us a sense of um, that About 20 odd sculling boats in our fleet. Um, okay. But, but I mean, we've got a lot of private uh, singles. We encourage the girls to get private singles because you know, they, they're a fantastic investment because they, retain, they, they maintain their value. And they're also um, uh, really good in terms of uh, being able to, to um, you know, like just set it up for that girl alone and rather than having yes. to and, and um, you know, Danielle had her own boat um, you know, in front of us there, and she, you know, she did very well out of that. So, yeah, that, that saves a lot of time when you go down to the water in the afternoon and you're not messing around trying to set up a boat. Yeah, completely. completely. Just put, put your hands on and go. Okay. Yeah, definitely. 
Yeah. Okay. And just, just to say to our viewers out there at the moment, if you have any questions that you'd ask to, to or that you'd like to ask uh, Ryan, please feel free to type them in and we can deal with that. Um, so tell us a little bit, I'll, I'll jump, uh, this video does quite a bit here because I've compiled it together. So I'll, I'll jump it on to, to another yeah, stage just, as well. Um, so this is a bit further on in the session. We're just doing some shorter work and you can start seeing things coming together. Um, if you jump it a bit further on, um, around 20 minutes a bit further um yeah you'll see a narrow part of the river um yeah there we go that's fine um so this is this is getting a better sense of of how they're moving and that rhythm that we're trying to create and that feel for the boat um and as a result chasing off the back end, they're running a longer stroke they're getting more cover um and also they they're getting a hold of the front end a bit better because they've organized it. so um we used, you know, this is a really narrow part of the river. So um, our Cox and Elise over there is, you know, um, negotiating that while trying to get them onto that rhythm. But I think for me, you know, you asked me earlier, what, what's changed in terms of um, my coaching and the focus is more about trying to create that relaxation in the boat and that organization so we can, we have that conservation of momentum. And that conservation of momentum is, is absolutely paramount. Um, I think a really good example of that is when the Danes r raced the GB heavy four, lightweight four, raced the heavy four at Henley. And you saw how the Danes were just moving so effectively. Um, and, and then, you know, they, um, uh, uh, and, you know, they're just outpowered, but actually they're staying almost level pegging with those guys because they're just getting a bit more run on the boat um, in terms of how they're organizing around the front and, and the turn of direction. Um, if you jump a bit further ahead, there's a clip of the, uh, so now I took this eight and I took, I took a number of girls out of this eight, um, popped them into um, a, um, just keep going a bit more, just a fraction more. Um, more. It started raining here. So the video ends and we start into a new one. So this is just before, um, uh, coming up is just before Henley um, Royal. So um, I, I, I took um, some girls out of this eight, um, took some girls from my second eight, popped them into this eight. And that was the eight that went to have the record. So this is, this is this eight here. Um, and then the quad on the right-hand side uh, there of the screen, the second eight on the left-hand side. And this is quite nice, kind of show the kind of competitive edge. I'm just doing some, some racing starts. Um, Liz in the stroke seat there was, um, you know, one of those, those, those people who I say, uh, um, you know, you know you could you could throw on any side of the boat um because she you know she she actually learned how to do some good sculling here at headington um but when you look at it the the quad raced woman senior at Henley women's and lost by three feet to a very high and handy um and Bill, high race boat. Bill, now wind it shop shop and gradually lengthen lengthen ten legs now legs down, legs down, middle four. Nice little piece down, to, uh, to, to, legs to down, legs down. Now we bring in the hips. Go, hips back, hips back. Down. So just a nice side by side play. Um, kind of gives you a sense of the speed of the quad. Um, that eight went sub the record. Um, and Chris Hermes did a phenomenal job with that eight that won Henley Women's that year. Um, and that quad lost um, Henley Royal by, I think it was about a foot um, that year. Um, yeah, it was quite a foot that year. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice little it, fact. <laughs> in, a, in which competition? Was that an open competition they raced in? Or? So, so for Henry Royal, uh, they, were, uh, they raced at the Diamond Jubilee and lost by a foot. And Henley Women's Regatta, that quad, uh, lost by three feet to Tideway Scholars. That was a se that was se woman senior. They had merged, I think, elite to woman senior that year because they didn't have enough entries in women's elite. Um, both crews went sub the record, um, so that was a bit of fun. Um, and I'd say it's probably, you know, that's 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 a good example of a of a uh, decent Headington quad. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And and eight for that matter. I mean, that eight was fantastic. Yeah. No, I, I've I'm full of admiration for what I've seen at the development of the program over the years. Uh, on the results, that's been pretty obvious and, and quite apparent to everyone. And you and I had a conversation a little while ago when I was uh, I was tapping you up to learn a little bit more about uh, <laughs> ju junior rigging, and, and you started yeah. showing me some of the 
the the way that your program is structured and, and I was really impressed because uh, frankly a national program would be very happy to be running a program like yours in terms of the data and the detail that you've collected so uh, you know uh, chapeau to you is all I can say in that sense um, just moving on a little bit here now we, you know we've talked a bit about the training we've talked about how we're rowing your development uh, as a coach and how you've got to, to where you are right now mm. now is a little bit of a reflective piece really it's it's looking back and what you would say to your younger self and how then we would actually uh, move that on to it to advice for young aspiring coaches so you, yeah. you you've got to slow the brain down here now ryan <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah you asked me this uh you know at the start and it is a it, the thing that jumps to mind is um i think i still had my athlete mentality when i started coaching which you know as as an athlete if i'm, I'm being really honest um you know I, 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 I was probably quite intense um, and I started coaching like that, you know, yeah, like, you know, everyone needs to be going for the Olympics, da, 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 you know, and actually that's not for everyone. Um, you know, actually the priority for any junior is, is, is to do well. And I was lucky to have someone like John Gearing, who now coaches Redley. He was at St. Andrews when I first started coaching at St. Andrews College while I was at Rhodes. And um, um, he gave me the, you know, the J16 group. And at the end of the year, I had one J16 left. And I was like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and John, John softened the blur because I thought I was going to be fired, you know. Um, John <laughs> softened the blur and, and said, um, you know, um, <laughs> he said, you know, like, actually, maybe they weren't the right characters to row. And I was like, no, that was 100% me just being, you know, two, you've got to be doing X, Y, Z. Then I had another group that came through, which actually ended up um, being his, his uh, four that he took from St. Andrews to Junior World to got bronze. Um, and I was a lot with things and I think John Gearing again was a great mentor in that way um, and then when I went to Johannesburg and, and, and did some stuff with, with um, uh, St Albans uh, you know the one thing I'll probably say to my younger self then again is just just enjoy the process and enjoy learning from others you know there were some phenomenal coaches at the time Chris, uh, Christian Vulcan who I could have jumped in a launch with more and I should have jumped in a launch with more because you know, he, he was great at the time. Um, Tim Hempstead, you know, he was my coach as a lightweight and just outstanding as a coach. I, you know, I think a huge loss uh, for, for, for coaching out there. I think if any Australian is one, wants to pick up a, another Harry Mon mindset, Tim Hempstead is that person. Uh, you know, and he lives on Magnetic Island at the moment. Um, so, you know, I'd, I, I would spend a lot more time slowing things down. Um, and Andy Green was another one who kind of pulled the, the levers on me and said, just slow slow down um, and I wanted to be head coach straight away and all that kind of stuff and actually I've seen coaches who have left Headington and gone too fast and actually made some big mistakes and I would say you know if you if you in the UK you you don't want to be thinking of a chief coach position before before at least 28 you know learn from people go work in different places learn from their mistakes let them make the mistakes um, and then read an enormous amount, you know, and um, there's some phenomenal books uh, out there, you know, Clive Woodward's book, uh, you know, is, is probably one of my favorites. Um, and he talks about teamship and uh, that culture that you need to develop and foster within a, a program and rowing lends itself to that. Yeah, you know, the other one is the school takes care of itself. Um, you know, great books in terms of that culture and that organizational management. Um, and, you know, well, the list can go on and on and on, um, you know, in terms of what's out there. But, you know, with Kindle nowadays, you can carry it on an iPad and walk around with it. So, you know, Tudor Bumper's book, really interesting, you know, periodization and that. So uh, I saw that on Jürgen's uh, desk once. I was like, I can't read that book. Um, you know, Athlete's Training Bible, another one, you know, it's a, 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 a triathlon, triathlon book, another really good resource in terms of making programs. Just take some time and learn and reflect and also listen to your athletes. Just, you know, they are, you know, they have a phenomenal amount of in input and learn from the people around you. I'm really lucky that I've got people like Katie Greaves who can walk in and say, Ron, I think this, you know, and, you know, I'll go, okay, let's, let's, let's go for it. You know, and I think that's really healthy is not trying to think that you have to 
lead by, you know, I'm a lead, leader. You, it's nice. It's a, it's a collaboration. And I think if you can foster that in your organization. You know, I've got a phenomenal J4 um, team coach, Oli Gerard, who's doing a really good job. But, you know, some of the stuff he's brought into the J4 teams has been brilliant. I'm like, hey, okay, this is great. I'm learning from, from him. So I think that's really healthy um, uh, when, when you look at your organization. Is, is, as a young athlete, you never stop learning and don't be in a rush. You know, as a young coach, as an athlete. Yeah, yeah, that transition can be quite difficult, can't it? To, to go uh, from athlete to, to coach, you want to hit the road at a million miles an hour and uh, yeah. you, you pretty quickly, things, are, things have to slow down. They are completely different sports. Coaching and running, physically running, are completely different. You know, it's, an, it's learning a new position. It's like going, cool, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, left, I'm, a, I'm a blind side flank in rugby. Uh, now I'm going to move to wing. You know, it's the same thing. The trans- same sports, but the transition from being in the boat to being out, uh, you know, in a launch, you've got to develop a different eye. You know? And Chris and I always joke, and we kind of spend the first few weeks of the season going, we've got to get our coaches out back. You know, um, so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, so how many coaches typically do you have work in the program? Ten. Okay. Yeah. And how does that mix around then? And this is related to what we've just discussed. How do you, if you like, program their development? So um, coaches are welcome to jump in the boat with us any time. And, you know, we do have um, regular feed, feedback and meetings. Um, I do ask my coaches to, to come you know, to take that step. You know, if you want, you want to find out something, my, my door is always op- open. And I've got some really young coaches who, who are always asking for a book or something or something they want to develop. And um, I think just having an open door policy, you can learn so much over a cup of coffee. You know, the amount of times I've had a cup of coffee with Paul Thompson and learned an enormous amount, you know, just by going to Cavisham and cycling up and down the towpath with him. Not necessarily the coaching stuff, but just having a dialogue with him. Um, and it can be about anything, you know. Um, you know, I learned an enormous amount from him, Nick Strange, you know, Richard Bolton, you know, Thrust, uh, you know, phenomenal coaches. Reach out there, make connections, go out to them, and, um, you know, you will learn an enormous amount from those guys because, you know, um, we, particularly in the UK, we have a wealth of coaches. You know, you just look, look around at the names, and you can go to any school, St. Paul's, you know, LEH, um, you know, uh, down the road to, to, to Henley, you know, Chris Booth has been involved for, I don't know how many years. Um, but sometimes, you know, I have a drink with them and the amount you pick up um, is phenomenal. And I would really encourage my coaches, any coaches, to spend as much time on that personal development. Fantastic. And I think that's probably the best place to actually leave this because I don't think you can say better than that and I'm not going to try to. Uh, so... <laughs> We've, we've bust through the hour as usual here on uh, Roll.Team, but it's, it's been fun. And I know that not just on this, but even just talking with you over the last couple of weeks, Ryan, I've, I've learned a lot and uh, it's made me reflect on, on uh, a lot of different things actually. But uh, I really, yeah, thank you so much for your time over the last couple of weeks and today. And I hope people have got something out of it and uh, I'll get this together. So I'm sure more people will uh, take a look at it as it goes out on YouTube Thanks. as well. So, Ryan, Ryan Domain, thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.